Number 5. The Real Life Conjuring Movies Now the Conjuring films are most likely where most of us know anything about the Warrens from. You know, had they not been made, they might have just stayed local New England legends. Notable for their contributions to a few famous cases like the Amityville Horror or the Haunting in Connecticut, a couple other notable ones. But no doubt it was James Wan's Conjuring franchise that made the Warrens into household names and made them not only iconic characters and horror canon, but storied real individuals. But how involved in the films were they, really? Well, unfortunately, Ed Warren passed away before the first one was ever made, so Ed never got to see any of the Conjuring movies. But Lorraine Warren served as a close consultant on them, ensuring that the stories were being presented in an accurate way, accurately depicting the Warrens' relationship as well. Now, of course, there are some liberties taken here and there with the scripts regarding the hauntings, but hey, that's Hollywood. That's how the Hollywood game goes. Fun little trivia for you, you might not know, even if you're a Conjuring super fan, but the real Lorraine Warren does actually appear in the first Conjuring. I know you're saying, of course she does. She and Ed are the main characters, but I mean the real life Lorraine Warren is a cameo in the first Conjuring film in a blink and you'll miss it scene. During one of the lecture scenes, you can see her sitting up in the front two rows in the crowd. Look for the very old woman who looks about 30 years older than all the other extras. That's the real Lorraine Warren. The actress who plays Lorraine's character in the films, Vera Farmiga, maintained a very close and personal relationship with the real Lorraine Warren, calling her a very close friend. After she passed on Instagram, Vera wrote, she lived her life in grace and cheerfulness. She wore a helmet of salvation. She donned her sword of compassion and took a shield of of faith. Righteousness was her breastplate and she has touched my life so. Wow, that is an epic description of like anybody. That sounds like a hero from World of Warcraft, let alone a ghost investigator. And hey, my ghouls and goblins, if you're looking for more scary content, where else could you possibly go? You are already on Top 5 Scary. If you want more stories about the Warrens, cursed items, ghosts, cryptid, aliens, and a lot more, click subscribe and stay scared, okay? Number 4. So what was real and what wasn't? Now, like I just said, The Conjuring is no doubt the most famous story involving the Warrens. But let's take a little look at how accurate the movie was to the real life case. In 1971, the Perrin family moved their five daughters out to their new farmhouse property and claimed almost immediately after moving in that they began to notice paranormal and supernatural occurrences. The eldest daughter said, whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house and she resented the competition my mother posed for that position. Ookie spooky. So there was a jealous spirit who had some serious spectral beef with Miss Caroline Perrin. According to the family, every morning the house would smell like dead bodies. Okay, I've lived in a few places like that. But what was really eerie is that Caroline Perrin claims she saw a spirit in her bedroom. I was in my bedroom about 5 o'clock in the morning when I had the first visit. I opened my eyes and I saw the most frightening thing I have ever seen in my life. It was a very tall woman. Her head was like a sack of cobwebs with little tendrils of hair hanging out. Oh, I'm sorry editors for whatever pictures you're going to look up for that one. Sounds like they cleaned Bethesda up for the movie, to be honest. Fun fact, Bethesda also was not made up for the movie because there was a real life Bethesda Sherman buried nearby who lived next door to the infamous farmhouse. Now, whether or not she was a Satanist and a witch who sacrificed her child, that much we don't know. But there was really a real life Bethesda Sherman who lived right next door to the cursed farmhouse. Now, probably one of the bigger differences between the film and the real life case is that in the film, Ed Warren saves the day and heroically performs an exorcism. But in real life, Ed never performed exorcisms as he wasn't a priest and it would be crossing a line. The pair were devoutly religious and believed that those without religion were more likely to be attacked by demons. Now in actuality in the Perrin house, Roger Perrin actually kicked out the Warrens and he said that they were making his wife's health much much worse. The Perrin family stayed in the house for 10 more years, allegedly undergoing non-stop hauntings for a decade. But man, the rent must have been really good. Number three, they wanted to be artists. You know, believe it or not, the pair of legendary demonologists had actually not always planned on investigating the occult and the unknown. Does anyone really? You can't really go to school for that. When the two had married, they both had believed that they were going to make a career out of being artists. Ed Warren had gone to art school at New Haven, and Ed Warren began a modest career trying to paint landscapes, but he was not finding much success. He felt that he lacked a subject that he believed really spoke to people 
someone made a connection with people. And he was struggling over this. As as beautiful as a Connecticut landscape is, it just was not landing with people and he wasn't selling enough. He had held a long standing interest in the supernatural and paranormal after an incident as a young boy where he encountered a ghostly spirit in his own home. So he decided that for his future endeavors, he would make a collection of paintings of local haunted houses. He would read in the newspaper for stories of haunted houses, then drive up to them, paint the houses outside, and then offer the paintings to the homeowners in exchange for information and intel about the haunting. He and Lorraine actually sort of got their start as paranormal investigators this way. They spent five years on the road, traveling as a pair of nomadic haunted house painters turned investigators, in which is no doubt one of the most unique ways to begin a career. Initially, Lorraine was more of a skeptic than a true believer, believing that most of the people they met and spoke to were just people with overactive imaginations. Obviously, she changed her tune a little bit as they made a storied career out of this. After spending weeks that turned to months and years on the road, Lorraine said she felt the similarities between each case, despite them all occurring in different states and communities, and saw a beauty in them exploring the world while Ed would be there covered in paint to explain the spirit world to their hosts. Number two, they met real young. For a pair so closely connected to the spirit world, perhaps it was fate that would bring the two together as soulmates. Ed worked at the local movie theater in town and Lorraine would frequent it. One of her friends had told her there that there was an usher there that she thought Lorraine might take a fancy to. Lorraine wasn't much interested in boys at all and it said that she was solely focused on her schoolwork and found most young men too rough around the edges. But when she bought a ticket, she recalled being charmed by the spiffy, energetic young usher one Ed Warren. He had his hair coiffed and his pants creased, which in 1943 was the absolute fanciest a youngster could possibly look. Ever the gentleman. After the movie, Ed offered to walk all three girls home, but first offered to buy them all a coke. Listen to that, he's like a regular Archie Andrews, this guy. He dropped a hearty 25 cents getting all three girls a soda, which again, was the biggest display of wealth anyone in 1943 could possibly have shown off. He walked Lorraine's friends home, and when it was just him and Lorraine, she thought that it might look a bit salacious. If he walked her home, she elected to walk herself home to the destination. Ed, ever the gentleman, nodded and took off. Lorraine claims that when she saw Ed walk away, she didn't see him as a 16 year old, but rather claims she saw him fully grown, saw him exactly as he would appear as an adult. She wrote in her diary that day that she found the man she was going to marry. Was it fate that had brought them together? Was it a divine purpose? Or were there just not that many cute boys in Connecticut at the time? Ed would be sent over to serve during World War II during the Navy, and he married Lorraine pretty much as soon as he stepped back in Connecticut, and the pair married when they were only 19 years old and remained married to the end of their days. Number one, they never charged money. Now, over the years, Ed and Lorraine Warren have received their fair share of controversy, accusations, and allegations about their intentions. There were more than a few people over the years who accused them of being little more than charlatans and grifters who were exploiting money out of people who just didn't know anything. Any better. The thing is though, while there is absolutely a conversation and a discussion to be had about whether or not they were wildly exaggerating cases or intentionally adding and stretching stories out to make them more exciting for better books and better Hollywood movies, the thing is, as paranormal investigators, they never once charged money for their services. Like I mentioned before, usually their way in the door was to offer a painting. They never asked for money out of the residence of any of their haunted houses or cases that they'd investigated. They probably just asked for the exclusive film rights to the story, if anything, and that's probably not even a joke. The way they mostly made money was by traveling to colleges and universities and giving lectures on the occult and paranormality. Ed and Lorraine, despite calling themselves demonologists, and that being the term most commonly associated with them, insisted that they were educators before they were paranormal investigators. That was their main goal. They had always wanted to make people aware of what had existed beyond the veil of our world. They had a goal of discouraging people from getting involved in what they didn't understand, saying that most of the people they met were young college age couples, and they had hoped that they could steer them towards a more righteous path. This is why they founded the New England Society for Paranormal Research to uncover mysteries and ended up working on 100 cases since its founding. Now today, the foundation is run by the Warren's daughter Judy and their son-in-law Tony Spera, who has taken upon himself to maintain the Warren's legacy, including running their famed museum of haunted objects. It's closed right now, 
Hopefully just for some like rearrangement. Hopefully Annabelle didn't break loose or nothing. But it is hopefully reopening back soon. So you can get back to peering at that collection of haunted relics and cursed objects. Number 5. Ed Warren's Haunted House Ed and Lorraine probably spent more time inside haunted houses than most people spend inside regular houses. As the world's most storied demonologists, they certainly knew their way around a haunting. Was it their calling perhaps? Ed Warren would disagree, saying he thinks a calling is something lofty and majestic in his own words, but rather he thought that it was something that in fact guided him to becoming a warrior of the spirit world. Perhaps it was a twist of fate from the start that made Ed pursue his career in demonology, as the first house he had ever lived in as a boy was a haunted house. Makes sense, right? In fact, Ed Warren's first ever reported interaction with a spirit was when he was just a child. The Warren family landlady, who Ed Warren described as not particularly nice, hated kids, dogs, cats, and would sit by the window and yell at neighborhood kids. She lived above them and would pass. Ed describes an encounter when he was a young boy where he went upstairs and saw his closet door swing open by itself. Inside the closet was a small floating dot of light that began to grow and grow and grow. In a few seconds, the light grew to the size of a person and manifested as the landlady, wearing that same scowl that Ed would recognize. Ed ran down and told his father what he had seen, who had told him to just forget it and never tell anyone. He wouldn't tell, but he certainly would not forget. And Ed Warren credits this incident with being the inciting event to inspire him to research the paranormal and to study the things that live beyond our world. Soon after this event, he would start to be reached in dreams repeatedly by dead relatives he had never met, including an aunt who would send him messages about his future, offering him guidance, and telling him that one day he would walk alongside priests but would not become one himself. He was attending a Catholic school while also living in a haunted house, a fact which amused him greatly as a boy. He said, although he didn't like going to church, he would pay extremely close attention to lessons about spirits and demons, as he knew it was going to be incredibly important in his life one day. And my ghouls and goblins, if you're looking for more facts and videos about Ed and Lorraine Warren, the cases they've studied, cryptids, aliens, and just about everything weird and unusual. Top 5 Scary's got all of that and then even more on top of that waiting for you. So click on through, find something freaky, creep on creeping on, and subscribe, maybe. Number 4. Lorraine's Abilities Much like her husband Ed, Lorraine would know from a very early age that the spirit world was reaching out to her. Barely even three blocks away from Ed Warren, Lorraine lived. Was it fate that had brought them together? Some divine purpose? Or a happy coincidence because they live pretty close together? Lorraine Moran had a knack for extra sensory perception, and as a young girl had believed that everyone had this sixth sense that they had access to. She didn't know that we're not all psychic. Sorry Lorraine. At the time, Lorraine was attending a private all-girls academy, and one Arbor Day, the nation's favorite holiday and every child's favorite holiday, her class was planting trees outside in the front, and Lorraine found herself distracted. She describes how as soon as the girls in her class had planted the sapling, she looked at it, and saw it not as a sapling, but rather vividly saw it as a completely full grown tree, with its branches stretching outwards into the sky, its leaves blowing and falling. Lorraine said it was indistinguishable from the real thing, not like a hallucination, like she could see it right in front of her. She said she couldn't even tell that it was a second sight. She was completely lost in the majesty of the tree when her teacher asked her what she was doing looking so intently. She said she had been staring at the full grown tree. Her teacher, confused, asked her if she was seeing the future, and rather matter of factly, Lorraine responded that yes, she was. Although Lorraine thought answering honestly was the right thing to do, she was sent to a weekend church retreat to pray and pray and pray away her delusions. Lorraine learned rather quickly to keep mention of her extrasensory vision to herself as most people in small town Connecticut didn't quite understand her abilities. It wouldn't be until she was 18 years old and met Ed Warren that she would find a confidant who understood what she saw and how she could use her gift to help people. Number three. How psychic is she? Naturally, Lorraine's psychic abilities came into some scrutiny. I mean, that does make some sense. I mean, you claim you're psychic. People are going to ask you all sorts of annoying questions like, are you really? No one just trusts you. Interestingly, even Lorraine herself didn't fully believe in the paranormal until she made a career of it. In the beginning, Lorraine was wary of just about everyone they had met and believed that the people who were reporting these hauntings or describing strange things in their home were just speaking with an overactive imagination or were just making things up for attention. And save that point for later in the video because that's going to come up again. It was only after working several cases where she started to notice recurring trends between everything that they'd worked on and all 
the things that these cases were telling her that she started to believe that what she was doing was real and there was a grander connection to it all. After they started to become more well known for their work on the cases that inspired The Conjuring or the Amityville Horror, there was some outcry from people who said that Lorraine was faking this and the two of them were faking it. So to quiet her critics, Lorraine had herself tested by a doctor named Dr. Thelma Moss, who is a parapsychologist studying abilities outside the human experience. Researching things like extrasensory perception, the spirit world, Lorraine went for extensive psychic testing and the doctor had reported that Lorraine was an above average clairvoyant. Ooh, put that on the fridge. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed were renowned enough as psychics that even law enforcement officers took note of it and had actually requested for Lorraine Warren's aid on a string of missing persons cases, believing the help of a psychic would be just what they needed, a move that was seen as a bit controversial at the time. Number 2. Their relatives carry on their legacy Although Ed and Lorraine Warren themselves unfortunately are no longer with us, they worked hard to ensure to pass on their ideas, their teachings, to ensure that their legacy would outlast their mortal forms. And I mean, that's kind of if you believe they're really gone. I mean, these people worked with spirits their whole life. They've got to be out there somewhere, their spirits guiding, right? In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research as a way of tracking and documenting their cases. As well, Famously, just like shown in the movies, Ed and Lorraine kept a magnificent museum of all the cursed relics, horrible things, and demonic objects that they'd encountered over the years in their cases, including the infamous Annabelle amongst many, many others. She doesn't quite look like how she does in the movies though, she's a little more raggedy in real life. But with Ed and Lorraine no longer around to run the society, it was now left in the hands of their daughter Judy and their son-in-law Tony Sparrow, who has taken it upon himself to maintain the Warrens' legacy and is a demon demonologist and paranormal investigator of his own volition. He inherited their museum of cursed objects and he takes care of their most dangerous ones, maintaining the rituals necessary to keep them cleansed and pure. Now, unfortunately, the museum is currently closed at the time of this video, but Mr. Spera is working to get it reopened to the public. Annabelle does tour though, if you're ever looking to catch her in your town. She's got a good agent, I guess, and she makes appearances all over at paranormal conventions. You can take a photo with her, she takes lots of photos with fans. She doesn't really answer too many questions though, she's not a big talker. Spera isn't the only of the Warrens' relatives trying to carry on their legacy, however. Their nephew, one John Zappis, who I've mentioned a few times on this channel actually, was inspired by stories and tales of his demonologist uncle as a boy and followed in their path, becoming a paranormal investigator himself and opening his own museum of haunted relics just outside of his home, just like his uncle. You gotta wonder if there's any members of the extended Warren family who don't have a museum of cursed relics and if they feel a bit left out. Zaphis's museum, much like the Warrens, is blessed and anointed with holy water and monitored closely by a priest to make sure none of the haunted relics dwelling inside it worm their way loose. Number 1. Maybe it was all fake though. Well, it feels really wrong to end the video on this point, but it also felt really wrong to not mention it all either, and I thought it was either number 5 or number 1, and I settled on number 1 being a better ending. I believe any good skeptic or paranormal enthusiast must always ask themselves the toughest question when it comes to anything supernatural. Was it real, or were they just making it all up, okay? Every molder needs a scully asking those questions. It's been a long running debate and discussion as to whether or not Ed and Lorraine were really demonologists, or if they were just a pair of very charismatic charismatic storytellers, and it was a bit of a complicated ruse to sell a bunch of books and get some movies made. Now, since the Warrens have passed, several stories and more doubt has begun to creep out, decrying the Warrens as nothing more than grandiose storytellers. For one example, the lawyer in the Amityville horror case who was representing Ronald DeFeo, the assailant who slayed his family, admitted that a majority of the story involving the infamous haunting was all just that. Just a story generated under his own admission that he made up over a bottle of wine with the Lutz family, that's the family that moved into the alleged haunted house, as a way of cooking up the story a little bit in the hopes of getting a retrial for Ronald DeFeo. Another example that came out was the haunting in Connecticut case. Very famous case, the Warrens wrote a book on it, there were a few movies made. The Warrens book detailing their experiences with that case was called In a Dark Place. It was co-authored by Ray Garten who was a horror novelist who was asked to help out and punch up the novel a little bit. Garten had a bit of an issue though because he said when he was interviewing the 
family involved in the case, he found that their stories didn't match up, and frequently they were contradicting each other describing the haunting. Garden asked Ed Warren for advice on what he should do about it, and Ed gave him this response saying, Oh, they're crazy. You've got some of the story, just use what works and just make the rest up and just make it scary. Or what about the Enfield case, the basis for the second Conjuring film, which was greatly exaggerated, as the Warrens only arrived for a single day, uninvited, and were then sent away by the family. Ed Warren told another investigator working the case that we could make some serious money off of this one. And seeing how much money the Conjuring franchise has made, well, it seems like you don't need to be a psychic to see that and maybe the truth was getting in the way of a good story just a little bit. In fifth place, their origins in the profession. Honestly, before today, I never really dug too much into the personal lives of Ed and Lorraine Warren, preferring to focus my interest on their professional work and only really knowing about their daughter Judy from the rare time they mentioned her in one of their books and her husband because of all the rare footage he's publicized since Ed and Lorraine's death. Outside of the Hollywood romanticizing, which I promise I'll touch on eventually, how did Ed and Lorraine actually fall into this line of work? So Lorraine was nine when she first saw auras. She thought everyone saw them, but found out quickly otherwise when she brought it up at her Catholic school when she compared the lights surrounding the Mother Superior and Sister Joseph and was told immediately to never talk of what she saw ever again, learning to, you know, hide her gifts or joke it off. Ed, on the other hand, grew up in a haunted house. He'd look into closets and see faces, one specifically of an old lady. The temperature in his room would drop and he would hear footsteps and heavy breathing. When he brought it up to his father, he was told that, you know, there's a logical explanation for everything and just leave it at that. So they both did their very best to try and ignore their gifts, wanting to live normal lives, but the universe drew them together and had different plans. Ed had a near-death experience while serving in the Navy during World War II when the ship he was on collided with an oil tanker in the North Atlantic. A fire erupted and all of the men on the ship had to jump overboard. As Ed was in the icy water, he prayed for help and was soon rescued, believing it to be from cosmic interference. So after that experience, he returned home and asked Lorraine to marry him and they got married almost immediately. After the war, Ed took up a profession as a fine arts painter, with the duo traveling from fair to fair to sell their wares. And eventually this became helpful during the beginnings of their work. They would research houses they believed to be haunted and then, you know, go to that house. After Ed would paint the domicile, he would hand the painting to Lorraine, who would knock on the door and offer the homeowners the painting as, you know, their ticket into the house. Once she struck up a conversation with the homeowner, they would learn more about the property and hauntings, if there were hauntings, that is. At one house, which already had, you know, some local notoriety as a supernatural hotspot, Lorraine went into spontaneous trance and claimed that this is where she learned not to fear death. Hmm, I thought there was more to that. In fourth place, we have the White Lady Hoax. Just so we all have the same context going into this, the White Lady is the name of the ghost that haunts the Union Cemetery in Easton, Connecticut. So most locals believe her to be the ghost of Harriet Seeley, whose young son passed shortly after being born, with Harriet herself passing soon after. Legend believes she may have died in hopes of finding her son, and still wanders their final resting place searching him out. Other folks believe the White Lady is the ghost of a woman from the 1940s who killed her husband and later herself and is, you know, doomed to wander the graveyard. Her physical description is the one thing that remains consistent. She is a young woman wearing a white dress with dark hair. So me if I was wearing white, which will never happen here. I promise you that. It seems as if she enjoys scaring the daylights out of the living, which, you know, once again, my kind of gal. Many who have witnessed her believe that they have almost hit her with their vehicle, only to find no trace of her once they pull over. Others claim they have often seen her hovering slightly above the ground around the cemetery, going back and forth amongst different gravestones. Now, Ed Warren was obsessed with her and has gone on record as being, you know, determined to capture footage of her on film. Once he was able to do so, he uh, kept the tape for himself. Yeah, he hoarded that tape like it held the secrets to the universe, or you know, like he was the US government with all the proof they have of alien life. He allowed a select few people to view it while, you know, it was being held in his personal archives, and none were ever allowed to further analyze it on their own time. I'm raising an eyebrow right now in suspicion. And once again, if I uh, had a red flag, I'd be waving it right here. So since the passing of both Ed and Lorraine, their son-in-law, Tony Spera, has released the footage in its entirety to YouTube. The tape shows an apparent white human figure moving behind some tombstones. Similar to videos of UFOs, you know, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster, the figure is at that perfect distance and resolution so a shape can be seen, but we don't have any details that could lead to a definitive identification. A woman named Judith Penny, who I will discuss in more detail later, has said she helped Ed maintain his reputation as a ghost hunter. So what does that mean? So when he claimed to have captured the um, white lady on tape in the summer of 1990, after camping out in the graveyard for a week, allegedly, Judith was the mystical being spotted on tape, masking herself with a white sheet. In third place, we have Catholicism as an undercurrent. This is probably the only thing that has always 
always bugged me, and while it might be less of like a secret in the gotcha sense, allow me to explain. Hauntings Ed and Lorraine spoke about were caused by people who refused to conform to traditional family values. Only people who submitted to the patriarchy and the church could be safe in their eyes. Their 1980 book, The Demonologist, kind of explains it all. That Ouija boards would get you haunted, but so would reading books about witchcraft, owning an image of a non-Christian deity, or attending conscious raising groups. The horror in Amityville was supposedly aggravated when the unlucky homeowners engaged in the unholy pagan practice of, uh, oh yeah, meditation. Addiction, depression, and disobedient children were all satanic. Hate, rage, despair, misery, drunkenness, and a sense of worthlessness will attract the demonic in a snap, according to Ed. One story in The Demonologist centers on a young woman who succumbed to evil after being fornicated with against her will. I do own this book, and I remember that not sitting super well with me. It was essential not just to stick with the status quo, but to be satisfied, with Ed going on record as saying, you know, that a happy home is one's best defense, and even the most powerful exorcism will be effective only if you keep up an emotional atmosphere that does not attract such entities. And while I do believe this to an extent, not so far as Ed does. That atmosphere would involve going to church, by the way, saying that once a week was a good start. Yeah, I, I, I don't go to church. When you really think about it, the Warren's entire basis of work kind of relied on victim blaming, evil that could you know, only happen to people who were already evil themselves. So personally, I don't agree with this whatsoever. Bad things do happen to good people, and not just because they don't follow Catholicism doesn't make someone evil. If you don't see what I'm seeing, allow another quote from Ed to help clarify things. <clears throat> people who do negative or patently unnatural things are essentially doing the devil's work for him and actually attract negative spirits to their side. Ed Warren was the homophobic brand of Catholic. Yes, I'm fully aware that not all Catholics observe this, and while most do not, Ed fell under that specific strain that sadly does. As a queer gal who didn't fully learn this until today, it kind of broke my heart that people who were so open to helping others and the unknown could be so close-minded. In second place, we have fraudulent items in the museum. So Ed and Lorraine were investigating numerous cases from the 1950s until they passed, right? And they founded like a whole society devoted to the research and investigation of the paranormal in 1952. You know, not to forget their entire museum attached to their home, dedicated to objects from their cases. So explain to me how their website only has 10 public case files, and why so much from the museum looks like leftovers from a spirit Halloween. Doesn't anyone else find it pretty suspicious that we only get details from the really big news cases, while artifacts from other, like, lesser cases are barely a footnote and have no story or witnesses attached? So in one corner of the Warren's Occult Museum is the skin of a tiger that is said to have killed 33 people in India while possessed by a demonic spirit. But yet, when I try to research this were tiger, I find no account of any reportings in history about such a case, outside of, you know, their quote or any offers from Anne Lorraine to go into detail about any events leading to how it came into their possession. Seriously, take a look at some of this stuff. Given what I know about modern day Satanism, that idol looks like a paper mache alien mock-up. Well, most folks who practice Satanism don't actually pray to any sort of idol or to the devil himself. But sure, for a moment I'll pretend like that's real and move on to the um, black magic skull, which just looks like a cheap haunted house prop for a glow-in-the-dark room. Ditto for the um, chilling masks. You know what, actually that's a lie. I've seen cosplayers make better masks. I'm not going to even try to rationalize the skull with horns or the recreation of the Witch of Monroe. Y'all don't need to see me fuming right now. In first place, their personal life. So if you watch the film franchise, you'd think Ed and Lorraine had a pretty ideal, wholesome, perfect Americana family style life. But the reality isn't so shiny or pure, despite what, you know, they preach all the time. In the early 1960s, Ed Warren initiated a relationship with an underage woman with Lorraine's knowledge. Ed was in his mid-30s when he met Judith, who was exactly half his age. Yucky. Having not yet gained enough fame as a self-trained demonologist to pay the bills, Ed was working as a city bus driver in Monroe, Connecticut, while Judith was a student at Central High School in the nearby town of Bridgeport, who, you know, conveniently rode his bus route. The two began an amorous relationship, according to a legal declaration from Judith in November of 2014. Heck, by 1960, in 1963, she had moved into the Warrens' home, and for the next 40 years, she had a sexual relationship with Ed with Lorraine's knowledge. That same year, Judith was arrested after someone reported her relationship with Ed to local police, because, you know, busybodies everywhere. And she spent a night in the North End prison in Bridgeport while police tried to persuade her to sign a statement admitting to the affair. After she refused to cooperate, she was ordered by the court to report to a delinquent youth office for the next month. So, you know, Ed, being the great guy he was, picked her up from school every week and drove her to the mandated meetings. Judith claimed that Ed told her many times that she was the love of his life. 
The Warrens explained her presence in the home as a, you know, a niece or a poor girl who they had taken in out of charity and who helped them with office tasks. And she was mentioned in a lot of their books as being, you know, like their secretary, uh, most notably in The Demonologist, which I've already quoted a couple times today. What do you know? I own a copy. In May of 1978, well in her 30s, Judith became pregnant with Ed's child, and Lorraine persuaded her to have an abortion because the birth of a child could become public and any scandal could ruin the Warrens' business. Now, if that wasn't awful enough, Judith has also claimed that Ed was, on occasion, physically offensive to Lorraine. Judith described one night in particular where she saw Ed slap Lorraine so hard she lost consciousness. Early on, she said, she witnessed him backhand his wife. Well, it might be easy to dismiss all these claims as, you know, hooey or someone trying to make something out of nothing. There is an interesting element from Lorraine that kind of proves this to be true. So when Lorraine signed on to consult on The Conjuring movies, she got a contract that states that the movies will not feature negative information about the Warrens, mentioning specifically intercourse with minors, youngling bad videos, youngling uh, bad videos, anything to do with women of the night, or sexual violence. Kind of weird to have to spell that out if you don't have anything to worry about. Now, this is where I was wondering, well, where was the daughter in all this? Judy is still very much alive. What did, you know, what does she have to say about it? She spent most of her years living with her grandma and not her parents, claiming that it was because her parents were always traveling, so it was the easier and safer option. Her parents told her that they took Judith Penny in so she could have a place to stay and watch their house. But their daughter could have helped watch the house if she lived with them. Just saying. Number five, the Amityville horror photo. The Warrens had been around, claiming to have seen 10,000 cases in their lifetime. But there are few of many cases that got them as much renown and people talking as the Amityville horror case. Way before there were any Conjuring movies, way before it was a smash hit franchise, they were already making tons of movies about Amityville. The Warrens have been in the silver screen since the beginning. Amityville Long Island was the center stage for the most infamous and strange case in America. In 1974, the house had been owned by the DeFeo family, until one day, Ronald DeFeo Jr. went one by one with a rifle and claimed the life of every member of his family, later going on and telling people that spirits had commanded him to do so. After this horrifying event, a year later, the Lutz family would move in. Not much bothered by the house's dark history. You know, in this market, you gotta take a good deal on rent wherever you can get it. During the first month of living there, they realized almost right away that something was wrong. Swarms of flies, banging noises, and spectral apparitions of monstrous animals or phantasmal beings that the real estate agent definitely did not mention. Now, the Warrens were called in as they were experts in the paranormal, and they were called in to investigate the haunted and see if there was anything they could do. They brought with them camera crews and tried to record their findings, most famous among them a photo of what appears to be the ghost of a boy with shimmering eyes staring down from the stairwell. It's truly chilling stuff. Now it has to be addressed even by skeptic standards, sorry we gotta play Scully, can't all be Mulder over here, that there is a lot of debate as to whether or not the Amityville horror was more like the Amityville hoax. George Lutz, the father of the Lutz family, contacted the DeFeo's lawyer William Weber and said he was trying to get a book written up about the client and Weber had told news media that the haunting was all just a story he had made up with the Lutz family over a bottle of wine in the hopes of getting a retrial and in the hopes of getting a little bit of change for the Lutz family. So what do you think? Was this America's most famous haunting or was it just a fantastic backdrop for a series of okay movies? And my ghouls and goblins, if you're looking for some more terrifying true tales or tales that ain't so true, from ghosts to cryptids to aliens and a whole a lot more. Top 5 Scary has all of that and then way more. Drop a like and subscribe and stay scared. Okay, moving on. Number 4, Enfield. Another very discussed case from Ed and Lorraine Warren's case files is the infamous Enfield poltergeist haunting. It served as the backdrop for the second Conjuring film, although the second Conjuring took a bit more liberties than the other films. There was no Crooked Man or Valak in the original haunting story, but it's still pretty interesting to listen to nonetheless. It captivated audiences worldwide after photos surfaced showing what looked to be the young Hodgsons being possessed and thrown about the room levitating. It was six years after the Warrens had investigated the Perrin family haunting, all the way in Enfield, England. The Hodgson family had been living peacefully there, helmed by the single mother Peggy Hodgson and her four children. It was the summer of 1977 when the youngest members of the Hodgson family seemed to be being targeted by spirits. They saw the dresser of their bedroom sliding across the room as if a powerful invisible force was pushing it all around. They would hear constant knocking from all over. Now The family called the police because they were worried that there had been 
in a burglary. And when the officers arrived, they claim that they arrived to a home where the furniture was free floating throughout the air. Pretty wild stuff. Now, over the course of a year, psychics, investigators, amateur, and all kinds of paranormal enthusiasts came to the Enfield house in the hopes that they would be able to figure out the haunting and crack the case. Of course, it goes without saying that if this many paranormal enthusiasts were all congregating in one place, Ed and Lorraine Warren were definitely there. They were certain they had their hands on a classic poltergeist scenario. Now, like I said, between the film and the true story, they differ pretty greatly in this example. Really, the Warrens were not terribly involved with the Enfield haunting that much at all. In fact, they were barely there for a few days even. Most of the investigators that had arrived to the Enfield property had kind of suspected that it might have been a hoax or that things had been largely exaggerated or misunderstood and stretched by people involved. But the Warrens believed that they had a good, firm case on their hands. Now, unfortunately, we can't ask them, so we can only speculate. Was that because there was a real spirit? A real haunting or is it just because they had the foresight and they knew that this was going to make a great script for an entry in a movie franchise someday. In 1979, two years after the first reportings, the Enfield haunting mysteriously stopped. No more sightings, no more reports. Was it ever really there? Number three, the shadow doll. When you enter the Warrens haunted museum, one of the first things you'll see is this frightening little doll, affectionately dubbed the shadow doll. It's made of bird feathers and real human teeth. Oh, that's, that's just just lovely, thanks. It's currently owned by Tony Spera, the son-in-law of the late Warrens and the current proprietor of the museum. He offers a little bit of insight into the doll's unique history, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold with the owner unaware of the doll's negative energy, which I feel that that is totally on you. You're running an antique store and you're not a little bit concerned that someone came to you with a doll with real human teeth and bird feathers? I feel like you don't need to know that much about the occult or to be a big horror movie guy to know that is definitely cursed. If somebody comes in and drops a doll off of your store that has human teeth, your first response has to be to chuck that thing in the ocean, not put a $14.99 price tag on it. Oh, anyway, Sparrow claims the doll has an insidious little gift inside of it, and that's if you take a photograph of the doll, and then the photo develops, you write a curse that you'd like to inflict on the back of the photo, and then you send it to your victim. The person who then opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photo will invite the curse into your home. And I know what you're worrying about right now. Are you cursed right now watching this video? Nah, you're good. I think digital photos are fine, and besides, I would never write any curses on any of these photos. And if I was ever gonna curse you, I would curse you to always make the right amount of pasta and have your crush text you back. I would only curse you something real nice. Now my big question about the shadow doll is do you think it gets jealous having to share museum space with Annabelle? How hard must it be to be the second most famous cursed doll in a museum of cursed dolls? People come in all day to gawk at your movie star sister, get autographs and selfies with her, and you just have to sit and stew. No wonder the doll is cursing people. I think it's got some repressed aggression. Number two, the Southland Werewolf. This is maybe one of the odder cases in the war Warren's history, which is really saying something since the only thing the Warrens ever investigated was incredibly odd cases. This one was back in England again, in Essex. The Warrens got word of a particularly unusual case. This wasn't a haunted house or a poltergeist or a suspected demon possession or anything. This was someone claiming they had come down bad with a case of lycanthropy. There was a bad moon rising over Essex. A carpenter by the name of William Ramsey had claimed that since his youth, he had been cursed into transforming into a werewolf. Not every night or on full moons, but seemingly random times, the spirit of a wolf would overtake him and he would go feral. It hurts seeing someone live out your childhood dreams like that. He claims that he's been plagued his whole life and his first transformation occurred when he was a boy. He was playing outside when he felt an icy breeze coming over his skin, freezing his sweat to his skin. He then said he felt a primal bloodlust and hunger coming over him and he was overwhelmed by a pungent awful odor. He flew into a fit of rage and found himself shredding a fence post with a fence still attached and chewing at wire mesh. Now for years he wrote this off as a strange incident. You know, something that every boy goes through when you're growing up. Puberty is a strange time. It wasn't until 1983 that the wolf came out to play again. William was out at the pub with his friends when he felt that familiar chill come over him. He felt the sweat freezing to his skin and excused himself to go to a bathroom and claims 
that when he looked into the mirror, all he saw back was a wolf's unmistakable snout and yellow eyes staring back at him. He called the cab home, but had to be held down by the driver because he was thrashing and lashing out at the driver and other passengers. Eventually, he composed himself, I think they gave him a milk bone, and he tried to live quietly after these incidents. It was in 1989 when Ed and Lorraine caught wind of the case. They invited him to get to Connecticut for a personal exorcism. I thought it was silver bullets that dealt with werewolves, but I guess that's probably a more permanent solution. Exorcism was probably the right way to go. Initially, William was skeptical, which I find kind of interesting. You turn into a werewolf, but you're skeptical that an exorcism will make a difference? Anyway. He ended up visiting, and reports claim that after a long night of violent thrashing, the wolf was finally exorcised, and since then, William Ramsey was able to find peace. And number one, the satanic idol. I don't know, Ed and Lorraine, a satanic idol? A human skull? Well, those things sound like they could be haunted. Do you guys like haunted things? No way a satanic idol and human skull that were involved in dark rituals are haunted. No way. The skull was given to the Warrens as a gift, which is kind of an odd gift to someone, but hey, they were kind of odd people, so they were probably thrilled to death with it. Now, the idol is a different story. The tall, slender, bizarre idol doesn't immediately scream Satan or satanic, but you can take a look at it and you'd kind of be unnerved. This is not the kind of thing I would bring in off the side of the road. It's not the kind of thing you'd want to catch in the woods, and yet for one lonesome hunter, that is exactly what happened. Apparently, the idol and the skull with it were taken from the woods nearby to the Warren estate by a local hunter who'd found them. The hunter claims he was approached by a man in mysterious black garb who ushered him away. Now, obviously, he was a little shaken and stirred by such a bizarre experience, so he went to the only people he thought he'd be able to trust with something like this, the Warrens, and took the idol to them for safekeeping. After he brought it to them, Lorraine fell deeply ill with no one able to diagnose what was happening to her. Ed believed that his family was being targeted for welcoming the idol into their home. Hey, you'd think that a demonologist would have seen that one coming, but hey, we all make mistakes. Lorraine recovered, and although no details emerged on how she did or what they did to purify and cleanse the idol, we can assume most likely it was probably blessed, exercised, and doused in holy water of some kind, otherwise it wouldn't be fit to sit amongst their other treasures. It now rests inside the museum, alongside all of their other haunted relics. It's evil waiting inside as it waits patiently for a Hollywood executive to come to it, and it's open to offers for a three picture deal with spin offs included. Number four, Judith Penny. Perhaps the most serious claim regarding the pair had nothing to do with ghosts or spirits, but it was the nature of the relationship with Judith Penny and Ed Warren. In 2017, evidence surfaced from Judith herself to suggest that the movies left out one of the biggest details of their lives that Ed Warren was involved in an extramarital relationship with an underage girl. Judith has sworn that she spent four decades living in the Warren's house as Ed's lover, but that the relationship began when she was 15. The claim goes on to state that the couple told people she was their niece or a poor girl that they had taken in since she had nowhere else to go. In 1963, actually, Penny was arrested and taken into custody after a concerned citizen who noticed this reported the nature of their relationship to local police. She was ordered by the court to attend a delinquent youth office for a month. Penny would tell that Ed would pick her up from school and drive her to these meetings. Now, obviously, these are substantial claims and serious allegations. These didn't come out until after Ed had passed, but perhaps the most concerning piece of evidence was a bizarre contract Lorraine demanded that New Line Cinema follow. This strange deal insisted that Lorraine serve as a consultant on all of the films, which makes sense, they're about her. Where it gets a bit odd is restrictions that said the films could not show the Warren characters engaging in any criminal acts, could not show Ed Warren committing any extramarital acts, or romantically involved with younger people. Very suspicious. One executive at New Line said they had never seen a deal like that before in their career. It certainly raises a very uncomfortable question. Why would these things specifically be demanded not to be done? Number three, the skeptical society. I think a little healthy skepticism is good for all of us, even on a paranormal channel. I watch paranormal stuff every single day of my life, but I like to approach it from a skeptical angle. What can I say? I'm more of a scully than I am a molder. The New England Society for Paranormal Research isn't the only group in New England that was involved with the Warrens. Enter the New England Skeptical Society, existing as a bit of a rival to the Warrens. The Skeptical Society existed to uphold the tenets of science and reason versus paranormal speculation. The founder, one Stephen Novello, was a prominent neurologist and professor at Yale School of Medicine. And he did not think particularly highly of the Warrens. He was quoted saying, 
You meet them, and oh my god, you realize the guy had no idea what he was doing, didn't know the first thing about anything relevant to paranormal investigation or ghost phenomena. He was adamantly not a fan of the Warrens at all, even going so far as to decry their museum of the occult and cursed objects, referring to it as little more than off the shelf Halloween junk, dolls, and toys. Now, the Warrens refused to allow the skeptical society to shadow them on a case or investigation numerous times, apparently, with various excuses each time. When Sufficiently questioned about it, Ed Warren responded, You can't have scientific evidence for a spiritual phenomenon. An outright investigation by the society printed in a newspaper read, The Warrens claim to have scientific evidence which does indeed prove the existence of ghosts, which sounds like a feastable claim into which we can sink our investigative teeth. Now, what we found was a nice couple. Some sincere people, but absolutely no compelling evidence. Number 2. The White Lady Ghost Continuing on with the skeptical society, the frequent detractor of the Warrens. Many critics of the Warrens have noted their consistent lack of evidence for their cases. They've got a museum of cursed objects and haunted relics, but they don't seem to have any actual hard evidence of ghosts. The most prominent bit of evidence that they've ever put forward was a photo from the Amityville horror case allegedly depicting a ghost descending a staircase, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest the Amityville case was a fraud as a whole and should probably be questioned reasonably. One infamous ghost Ed Warren claimed to have seen was that of the White Lady Ghost, a ghost dressed in all white that haunted the Union Cemetery. Stephen Novello repeatedly questioned Ed, saying that if they had this video footage of a ghost somewhere, that it doesn't make sense why you wouldn't release that footage publicly to silence any critics or doubters. Eventually, Stephen was invited to the Warrens home to watch the tape and was sufficiently unimpressed. Why don't you take a little listen to his review after watching the clip? The piece de resistance of the museum is Ed's video of the White Lady of Union Cemetery in Easton, Connecticut. We've only been allowed to view this tape in the Warrens' home because Ed refused to give it to us to analyze, a common theme in our investigations. The tape shows a white human figure moving behind some tombstones. Like videos of UFOs, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster, the figure is at the perfect distance and resolution so that a provocative shape can be seen, but no detail which would aid identification. Ed Warren has not investigated this video with any rigor and refuses to allow others to do so. Despite Ed's insistence that he was engaged in research, he continued to jealously hoard his evidence rather than allow it to be analyzed. Now, detractors like Novella have suggested that the footage in question has been faked and it was just someone in a sheet. This footage actually is available now. After decades and decades of just talking about it, you can see the footage for yourself. It's available now on their son-in-law's personal YouTube YouTube channel after Ed had passed, and I will admit it is a bit blurry. It is kind of hard to make out anything. And finally, number one on this list is the smoke and the mirrors. We've already talked about the Amityville Horror House and the Lady in White here, and about how they're all fake. Well, guess what, folks? I hate to do this to you, but they ain't the only ones. Everything the Warrens did was just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. This mural haunting saw other experts come in and look at the space. Nothing was wrong with it. Some of the exorcisms they performed. Those people weren't really possessed by the devil. They were mentally ill people that the Warrens were preying on. The whole story about how they cured someone of being a werewolf, like, that doesn't even make any sense. Smoke and mirrors. That's what the Warrens' career was. Now, that's not to say that they didn't inadvertently stumble upon something paranormal every now and again. I mean, if you believe in that sort of stuff, then they must have based on how active they were in the community. But basically, a lot of our favorite stories that rocketed them to the top of the demonology community are completely fraudulent. I guess it's not the worst thing in the world to know that we aren't living among as many ghosts as the pair claimed that we were. Number five on this list is the haunting in Connecticut. This haunting is the haunting of the Snedeker family. Listverse writes, After renovations on the house were complete, Carmen Snedeker entered the basement for the first time. There, she found embalming equipment and body tags with the names of the deceased. The family soon realized that the house was infested with demons. Carmen witnessed the water in her mop bucket turn a different color. She recalled the mop water was blood red. I mean a deep, deep red. It made my skin crawl. 
The middle son said the lights were coming on and off and on and off even though there was no bulbs in it. Ed and Lorraine Warren assisted in performing an exorcism on the house which has brought closure to the family. Since then, no further paranormal activity has occurred. The Snedker family remained in the house for two more years before they relocated to Tennessee. So guys, all of this is well and good and it's what the Warrens want you to believe. Is it true? Probably not. You see, they had someone come in and write a book about the events that happened here. He went in and interviewed the family multiple times and it turns out that they couldn't keep their story straight at all. They were all over the place and it felt like nobody actually knew what happened. Then he went to Ed and told Ed that he can't write this story because nobody has any idea what actually went down. And you know what Ed said? Just make it up. That's literally what happened, guys. The story about this place is just made up and it was probably never even true to begin with. Also, while literal mop buckets were filling up with blood downstairs, the upstairs neighbor was totally fine and just living their life. Seems kind of strange that the demonic possession would differentiate between floors, but I guess that's what the Warrens want you to think. Number four on this list is the Vampire Girl. Now this is one of those cases that, if it's true, doesn't get enough of the limelight. The Warrens have dealt with werewolves before, and we actually looked into the South End Werewolf and what it's all about in one of our previous videos. But this vampire case... It never really gets talked about. The Warrens were brought in to deal with an 18 year old girl who was going down a path of vampirism. This girl was very interested in death and the underworld. She started performing satanic rituals by herself and as you'd expect, ended up becoming possessed. The possession was clearly vampiric in nature and the demon was hungry for blood. It's said that she would wait in cemeteries for unsuspecting victims and then attack them right when they got there. It was reported that 16 people were bitten by this girl and she would actually drink their blood. To my knowledge, nobody was killed, but there were obviously some pretty serious injuries involved. Now what strikes me as odd is why this case hasn't been discussed more. It almost feels a bit like a secret because it's never brought up and largely forgotten about. Yet, when you consider what actually happened and the events that transpired, this is one of the most shocking things they ever did. The fact that we don't bring up this case and talk about it more actually leads me to believe that if there is any truth to be had in the Warrens' exploits, it might be here. Maybe they were actually trying to protect the world from the truth here. The truth that vampires are potentially real. Number three on this list is Ed's relatives. This is something that really doesn't get mentioned a lot, but Ed Warren saw demons just like the rest of the people he tried to help. I think the media often portrayed the Warrens as these almost superhuman individuals who were impervious to the will of paranormal entities, but... Ed certainly struggled with this growing up and for much of his life. Apparently, Ed would be frequented by the ghosts of long past family members. These paranormal entities would speak to him and tell him to do things. He was pretty private about what they would say to him, but we know that he did in fact get frequented by them. Who knows what they could have told him to do though, or how long he was seeing these visions. I think the reason that this was kept under wraps for a while was to preserve Ed's image as the person who comes in and saves people from these paranormal entities, rather than potentially somebody who suffers from them as well. Number two on this list is Aaron Shane Johnson. This is the the infamous devil made me do it case. Orange Shane Johnson killed his landlord in 1981 by stabbing him to death. When he was brought to court though, he claimed that he was not in control of his actions and the devil literally possessed him and made him do it. Now this is pretty serious stuff, so how does Ed and Lorraine Warren fit in? Well, it's been speculated that Ed and Lorraine might have made the entire thing up, which effectively means that they were trying to get a murderer to go free based on a blatant lie. Johnson had a brother-in-law whose name was David. David was mentally ill. He needed professional help. The Warrens saw this as an opportunity and decided to try and exploit it. They came in and tried to manipulate the family to say that David was initially possessed with a demon and that Johnson came in, 
told the demon to take his body instead and saved David from said demon. If the public believed this, then the Warrens would be smack dab in the center of a massive demon case. David and his family would get a lot of money from publicity deals, and the murderer Johnson would get off scot-free. It was a win-win-win for everyone except the justice system. Well, David's family wasn't happy about it after some thinking. They ended up suing the Warrens, claiming that they manipulated them and tried to get a guilty man to walk free. Which if everything that I just said is true, they did actually do. Just another secret that came out that they didn't want to be revealed. And finally, number one on this list is Annabelle. In our last part of the series, we were breaking down some of the Warrens' cases and talking about how some of them may have been fraudulent. Well, a lot of you were commenting on that video asking about one of their most famous cases that I haven't brought up yet. Annabelle. The Annabelle doll is one of the most widely known cases that the Warrens participated in and would probably be on most people's list when it comes to the creepiest dolls to ever exist. This doll even inspired the creation of a horror franchise of the same name that's had three separate installments in it. Pretty good notoriety for an inanimate object. Or maybe inanimate is the wrong word when talking about Annabelle. The legend began back in the 1970s when a young nurse named Donna received the doll as a gift from her mother. The doll took up residence on her sofa and at first was a nice and calming little plush toy that had nothing demonic about it at all. Soon things started getting a little bit weird though. Donna would go to work and find things out of place or doors open that weren't that way when she left. Then her and her roommate started finding notes around the apartment. Tiny little scribbled notes on parchment paper that would read, help me. Finally, it all came bubbling up when Lou, Donna's boyfriend, was in her apartment one afternoon by himself. The most common version of the story says that he was napping and then woke up to the doll literally trying to kill him strangling him until he finally had enough strength to throw it off of him. Apparently he even had several scratch marks on him for a few days, but then they went away after that. This is when Ed and Lorraine entered into the mix. They took the story and absolutely ran with it. Apparently as they were taking this doll, which they had determined was possessed, as they were taking it back to a safe place, it tried to crash their car several times and only putting holy water on it would stop this interference. Of course, no one else was actually in the car at the time, so we just sort of need to take their words for it. And that's actually the thing with this story. The only actual evidence or proof about this doll is that they told people it was haunted. There's no video of it moving, there's no pictures of it acting crazy. Anytime I've seen it, it just looks like a regular doll. Because of this, we can't say that it's fake, but we also can't really say that it's real either. I will say, after everything we revealed in the last video, I'm starting to have a hard time just accepting what Ed and Lorraine tell me. So honestly, Annabelle being fake could definitely have been another one of those secrets that they just didn't want us knowing about. Number five on this list is the Dark Magic Doll. Yep, anything called the Dark Magic Doll is probably something I don't want to know about. That's most likely why Ed and Lorraine locked this thing up in their museum, because it's really not something that should be out in the public world for anyone to have. We've all heard about voodoo dolls before and the potential powers that they can have. Dolls that are made through some sort of dark ritual with the power to then affect people on a real life basis. Usually these dolls are made with a singular person in mind and the doll that's created can only ever affect that one person. The same principle applies to this magic doll, however, the thing with this one is that from my understanding, you don't need to make it with only one person in mind. Simply using the doll while picturing an individual should create the same effect as a voodoo doll. It's said to use this thing, you need to hang it from its neck, and then the person that you have in mind is going to get sick and eventually die. Now, I'm not sure if you can use this doll more than once, or if it's just a one-off, but it's probably a good thing that the public doesn't know such information. Think about how dangerous this doll actually is, especially if it got into the hands of the wrong person. Somebody who wanted to inflict harm onto someone else could easily do so from the comfort of their own home and nobody would be the wiser. To make this doll requires some pretty dark rituals and some sinister magic, but the Warrens were pretty secretive about the exact process of constructing this thing and again, probably for the best. Having information like that out in the open on how to make such a deadly and dangerous doll just isn't safe for anybody. Right now, the only known doll is currently locked up in the Ed and Lorraine Warren Museum. 
Hopefully it stays there and we don't ever see any more of these creepy things popping up in the world again. Number 4 on this list is the Smeral Haunting. So we've all heard about Amityville and we've heard about the Enfield Poltergeist, but one haunting that didn't get talked about nearly as much was the Smeral Haunting. Maybe it's because it was just a little bit too scary and the Warrens didn't want to release such information to the public. An article discussing the 7 best cases from Ed and Lorraine writes, In 1974, Jack and Jeanette Smeral moved into a house on Chase Street, West Pittston, Pennsylvania. Strange occurrences followed, leading the Smeerls to believe that a demon possessed their home. They claimed the demon had slammed their German Shepherd into a wall, bit Jack's ear, and pushed one of their daughters down a flight of stairs. Both Jack and Janet were said to have been assaulted by the demon. In 1986, they contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren, who confirmed that their house was indeed haunted. Ed Warren would go on to say that he had witnessed a dark mass form inside the home and that the demon had left him a message telling him to get out. Now one thing that I think gets glossed over a little bit in this article is the time that these people moved into their home compared to the time that Ed and Lorraine actually showed up. 1974 is when they entered this house and Ed and Lorraine didn't get there until 1986. These people were living in a home that was severely haunted, so much so that they were getting assaulted by a demon and they were living there for over 10 years. I think we think about haunting sometimes as being like a week-long scary event or something like that, but this was literally over a decade of living in absolute fear. Why this family didn't move is beyond me, but maybe they were scared this creature would just keep following them wherever they go. I think this is why this one doesn't get talked about as much. Six months is one thing, but ten years is totally different. Ed and Lorraine knew that and probably didn't want to scare the public into thinking that they could get haunted for potentially their entire lives. Number three on this list is the African Fertility Dolls. Tony Spera goes into detail about these dolls on the official Ed and Lorraine YouTube channel and the story is pretty creepy. Apparently these dolls, which are now in their possession, were originally from Africa. They were made by an African witch doctor, but were then stolen from him and brought back to America. They were sent to a police officer who was in on the theft and thought that he could get some serious value for some authentic African fertility dolls. What he didn't expect was for these dolls to take his life. After he acquired these dolls, he soon became paralyzed from the neck down and after some time succumbed to this disease and died. These dolls are cursed, and after stealing them from the respective owner, took the life of those who were responsible. Now they're in the museum, and Tony warns us on the YouTube channel about ever touching them, for a similar fate could happen to us. It's stuff like this that really flew under the radar during Ed and Lorraine Warren's time. But the fact that these dolls exist, and there are probably many more of them in the world, is truly very terrifying. Number two on this list is the South End Werewolf. Born and bred in the Essex seaside town of South End, the first inkling of trouble came when William Ramsey was just nine years old. Like any normal child, he was outside in his back garden when he began to feel strange. It was deep into one Saturday afternoon in 1952 when an icy blast of frigid cold swept over him. Perspiration froze on his skin and a foul stench came close to making him vomit. The bewildered youngster only had two things on his mind, running away to a life on the ocean wave and wolves. By this time he was close to the garden fence and only the calls of his mother brought him out of whatever had gripped him. However, something else took complete control of him instead. Intense and pure rage had installed itself firmly within his psyche. Using this and the adrenaline fueled strength he now possessed, he had uprooted a fence post with the fence still attached to it and was swinging it like a club. Not even his parents could easily remove the post with their bare hands. That was a passage written by Les Hewitt talking about the beginning of the South End Werewolf case. This incident was the beginning of a long road for Bill. For 15 years though, he didn't have another episode until he started having dreams. Dreams that his wife would look at him and run off in fear after seeing him. These eventually ceased, but then 15 more years later at a party, it all came out. Apparently on the drive back home from this party, Bill lost it. He turned into a complete animal and the wolf came out. Scratching and biting at the driver, Bill had completely turned into a werewolf. His body changed too. His shoulders hunched, his nails grew to claws, his humanity had completely left him. The Warrens were then brought in to help him and had to perform several exorcisms to get rid of this werewolf presence. 
Think about this entire story though. Bill, to my knowledge, hadn't been bitten by a werewolf or had any extended exposure to one. He just became one. How scary is that? At any given point, I could just slowly start to develop werewolf-like characteristics and turn into a rabid super beast. I think that's why this case didn't get as much media coverage as some of the other ones. Just the fact that something like this could happen and I mean that could really scare the public.